Mesdames et messieurs, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, lovely and talented <laughs> Nathan Bulla. There you go. Is that my name? I I would sure hope you know your name, sir. I'm aware by now. The uh, as Chewy walks in the door. <laughs> Good timing, buddy. Uh, definitely, definitely one of the best and most dynamic drummer I know. And with the wettest feet right now. <laughs> Did my dog come and lick you? Oh, buddy. No, he just spit all over me. It's good. Oh, he's, uh, he, he breathes through his nose and <laughs> kind of spits through his nose when he's excited. He wants to be part of the interview. I think so. All right. Well, uh, let's, uh, let's get this thing going. Um, oh, you're prepared. When and why did you start playing? Well, why, I can't really tell you because I always knew. Like, I just knew that I liked drums. Um, it probably stems from my dad's band, from them practicing in my living room, and me just kind of coming down and staring at the drummer, really. Like, Who's your dad? What's your, uh, my what's dad's your name, name is Paul, and he plays keyboards, and he had a band for... He still plays with a lot of the guys once or twice a year, um, but they had a couple albums, and they were... Um, they were just like folk rock kind of thing, um, more rock than folk, I guess, in that sense. But the drummer was a jazz, um, jazz trained guy who went to Humber, hmm. and he's still one of my favorite drummers these days. He just has an interesting, very finesse touch to him. Um, so he was playing rock music with the band, and I was just always fascinated by how fluid and I don't know, just very delicate he was with his playing. And I think that was a really helpful first step to viewing a drummer and seeing how they, you know, how a, a really, uh, really like technically sound player will will sort of play, will at least add his sort of jazz touch to playing rock and where you're still hearing rock music, but you're hearing it from somebody that doesn't necessarily have the same influences as a, a slamming rock drummer that just hits really hard. <laughs> to create their vibe, you know, he had a vibe that was totally a lot more nuanced things and things like that. Yeah, it was it was a definitely an interesting guy to to watch. But so yeah, I was three when I when we moved to that house and when they started practicing in the living room, and it wasn't until I was twelve when I got my first kit. But I was asking for it for years and years. I actually had a little plastic kit when I was like six. But. So this is actually a nice segue into my next question: Which instrument do you play, sir? Oh yeah, the instrument would be the drums. Um, <laughs> the tambour for it's you a, French people out there. Yeah, it, it, it's a. It started with piano for me, which really helped a little bit. Like I had three or four years of um, of instruction from like a classical player and just kind of learning a little bit about dynamics and and really reading notation and things like that. And then when I ended up, you know, getting to drums, it wasn't until a few years into playing drums where I started seeing the connections directly. So, uh, how about this, sir? Why did, uh, why doesn't McDonald's sell hot dogs? Because you can get them on, <laughs> the, on the sidewalk. The you, can get, you can get hot dogs on the sidewalk from a street meat guy. Like, they don't need to, I mean, it's, it's you can't just go on the street, you know, like street corner, you can't just get a burger or fries. You know, it's a facility for something that can do something a little bit more than just hot dogs. I think hot dogs are too simple. Interesting. I think that's why. I'm sort of surprised they don't have that as an option because like Harvey's and stuff does, but <clears throat> that's, I also don't go out and to get a hot dog. Like no one really goes out and like, I'm going to go get a hot dog. Like you kind of, it's you got a pack of hot dogs. Or but you, you could go to meat. Harvey's to get a hot dog. True. I feel like it's more one of those situations if you're in Harvey's and you're like, I don't just want a burger. I also want a hot dog too. If you feel kind of gluttonous, then maybe it's not like an entire other burger to add. It's almost like a side. Because I know when I have hot dogs, I can have three or four without really feeling that Whoa. full. So like maybe other than drumming, you could have a possible c <coughs> career into a professional hot dog eating contest? Well, I wouldn't be able to compete with the best, but I would definitely be like regional finalist <laughs> if I wanted to be. <laughs> Cambridge, Ontario <laughs> finalist. Smith and Booth. Yeah, it would be... Uh, I'd I'd make people run for their money, but that's about it. I wouldn't win, I don't think. How about this at the movie theater? Which armrest is yours? Always the right side. The right side, eh? Yeah, always. Oops. Um, the the reason why is because 
I seem to always leave my left hand just sitting on my on my leg on my lap. I don't know why. Like even driving, there's the one rest on on the one door that I have, and even that is not comfortable to me. I feel like it's weird that I have to raise my left arm, but my right arm for some reason feels normal. It's funny you ask that because I actually have a preference. It's totally and same with the airplane and anywhere else. Like it's got to be my right, my right arm has to go up. Hmm. Feels very weird if I don't do that. So if I'm on the left side of the plane, I'll want to be on the window seat so that I get that that middle armrest, at least a little bit of it. Okay. It's important to me. Sounds like you're uh, blessed with the OCD, just like me. <laughs> <laughs> little things in life you appreciate. I know you've had a uh, number of bands, um, but let's say uh, we picked the last two or whatever you, whatever band you got comes to your mind. How did you come up with your band's name? Uh that that's funny because I actually have never been a part of that with any of my bands. Like I've only really been in like as far as being in bands, I've only been about three. Um, <clears throat> like as an actual formal member, um, and the bands that I've toured with, it's always just you know if it's been the band name, and then I've known that from the time that I meet them. But with my, I don't know. I mean, my first band was actually called the Vaz Deferens, and if you're familiar with any biology. In the middle regions, uh, that's actually something that's relevant. And it was, you know, one of those grade nine health class ideas that my guitar player had. But <laughs> we ended up changing our name down the line to uh, Mad Transit. And it was just, I don't know. I mean, I've never really been part of the reasoning or any of that stuff. It's always just been sort of, um, it's just been what sounds good and what doesn't really seem like it's too generic, but not too unique because it's hard to remember things that are too unique. My second band was called Chasing Amy, like the movie by Kevin Smith, but um, spelt with two E's because it was a copyright issue. So, I don't know. I mean, it never really ends up mattering to me as long as it's not cheesy. It's really difficult to come up with a good band name, I think. Like, to be really effective and to actually have like a, something that stands out and sounds unique and represents your sound, but, you know, doesn't... It's not a mouthful. It's not, you know, it's not like... <laughs> a tongue twister. Yeah, there's a lot of bands that are, they kind of go a little bit too nuts there. And how about your current band's name? Uh, my current band, Auras, that was formed orig originally from my guitar player, Josh. And I I actually don't even think I've ever asked him why <laughs> why he came up with it. I don't even think it's ever come up in conversation. I, I think it's more about, I think he, I, and I honestly just think he uh, was the... I don't know, I feel like it was not even really, maybe it wasn't even a him, and it was someone else that was kind of in the band at the time that was, like, they had a couple different options, and then someone thought about auras, and it seemed to be the most neutral and the most kind of, like, almost mysterious sounding. Um, then again, at the same time, it kind of backfired, because on Facebook, we'll get uh, tagged in hundreds of photos from uh, South American people and uh south asian people or asian people in general like like um indonesia a whole bunch of areas in that like the southern asian region so um nathan do they have the word dictionary in the dictionary well they have to don't they that's the million dollar question well dictionary is a word with a definition mm -hmm. so therefore it should be if it's a word that is recognized by the dictionary, it's in the dictionary. And if anything is on the front of the dictionary, it's a word recognized by the dictionary. Therefore, is in the dictionary. There you go. You heard it from Nathan, <laughs> folks. I feel like that's not that hard of a question, though. Well, I do know the answer to that. And you'd be surprised to find out that the word dictionary is not in a dictionary. Are you serious? I am not serious. <laughs> okay, because that doesn't make any sense. It is. It is. But it feels kind of, it's like an oxymoron. I, yeah, like I know, I know. It's, well, I mean, I don't know. It just seems, it seems like they could leave it out and not really, not a lot of people would be, you know, concerned about it, but. How about this? Do vegetarian eat animal crackers? <laughs> it depends if they're made out of animals. If they have dairy. But they're in the well, shape of an animal, so. I don't think they consider that be well, I think vegetarians are more concerned about living beings <laughs> and crackers are pretty far from that the crackers are dead well i don't think they could be dead if they were never alive they're inanimate <laughs> i know that they're delicious as well 
That's one of those things that's so addictive, the animal crackers. Mm-hmm. Once you start, or you can't stop. Crackers. That's another. That's the salt, though. The salt is what keeps you going back for more. Or McCain frozen cakes. Mm. <laughs> that's actually great. There's a lot of great. Yeah. <sighs> like hungry. bacon strips. I'm so hungry now. Hey, uh, what bacon was the uh, first tune you uh, learned that you uh, you wanted to jam on the drums? More like it with your dad or something. You know what? Funny enough, um, my dad and I never really jammed. Really? Almost ever until, really until I started, I mean, <clears throat> I guess the last couple of years really when I started playing a lot more weekly gigs, like near his house. I played a, at the Argyle Arms, which is where we we met, <clears throat> I believe the first time, back when I was like 15 when I first worked there. And I did a uh, the weekly Wednesday thing there the past couple of years. And my parents live around the corner, so my dad... If he's around, he would once in a while he would bring out his keys and he would come play with us. And that's kind of, I mean, we would jam as as well at the family party every year with his band. Like I would sit in for a couple songs, and I've been doing that every year for like ten years or something now. But the first song that I ever, it's it's tough. There was a kind of a collection of them, but the first one that stuck in my head, um, and that challenged me a lot. That actually kind of made me realize that. Maybe I wasn't playing the drums quite as technically sound as I could because I realized how much my forearm was working out this song. Um, Skater Boy by Avril Lavigne. It was a very fast... It's, I mean, the pulse, the hi-hats are just kind of moving the whole time. And I always thought that you just play down, 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 down. And then I didn't realize that it's sort of like a down and up and down and up. And on the way up, you're also hitting... It's just kind of letting your wrist move down up down up almost like a double stroke in the you, drummer your turn. wrist did the work not your arm exactly so i mean i was 12 i probably 12 or 13 and it was that and um like i actually loved creed a lot uh that weathered album was awesome it was very heavy i had a lot of great kind of like rock and feels to it without a lot of um specific drum placement so it was easy to kind of jam to and not have to worry mm-hmm. about specific things so that's another one that kind of got me going. Um, yeah, anything that really felt fun to hit hard for me was a lot of fun. And anything funky was really fun. Even though I didn't really, I was totally such a white boy when I was starting to play. Like I had no feel. I was just playing along to the grooves. But it let me, it let me gain perspective on what I sounded versus what the people I was trying to sound like sounded, which makes a huge difference seeing yourself hmm. on video or hearing your your first So what do you recording? think of drummers that don't have that feel look like Neil Peart for instance he's being referred as the human metronome but you see him play he's got no emotion in his face his body is straight only his arms are moving Yep What do you think of drummers like that then? <clears throat> I like those drum- I, I I always appreciate everything that every drummer does and Neil's actually one of those guys that he, uh, there's almost an exception just because of how long I've been listening to him for just for me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I definitely gravitate towards the ones that do have the emotion in their face. And it's such a, such a weird thing because drummer face is such a funny thing. <laughs> should do a show on that. It, it re- like it's really amusing. I actually have seen some guys lately that, um, there's one, so drummer in, the, uh, there's a local band called romancer and I just saw them a couple weeks ago and it was funny cause I know the guitar player, uh, his name's Riley O'Donnell. He's a, a incredible, player singer like he uses a loop pedal and all this stuff he actually does the subdivisions funny that we're talking about this he does a version of subdivisions on his acoustic with a looper pedal and it's incredible and Hmm. i did a weekly thing at the gators tail in cambridge and he came out one night and we did that together and so we've had him play at our family party every year because he's so fun and his drummer in romancer has some of the best drum faces i've ever seen and i thought i was like the maker of the best faces <laughs> and this guy he just he, like it's just all over the map like he's like riding a roller coaster the whole show and it's so but it's interesting because the guys that you see have that have that emotion drawn in even if they're not technically able to do a lot of the things that maybe you'll be impressed by you're a lot more um you're just gra- you you're grab it's gra- their uh, motion is just it's gravitational like you you can't feel like they're not pulling you in because they're putting so much raw energy into it. And it's not something that you can 
like technically move around a drum kit to create. You have to actually that totally uh, it sounds super lame, but it has to come from I don't even think the heart. I just think it has to come from your intention of what it should feel like. I think there's sort of like a that makes sense. There's also the drummers that get into it for that, and the drummers that get into it for the technical aspect. Mm-hmm. Which I know guys that play drums as a sport almost, and they're in speed metal <laughs> bands. And like my friend from Rings of Saturn, who would love to play uh, like groove oriented stuff because his favorite band's like Tesseract, and he listens to like um, what's that other band that's like they're way cleaner. Um, Bob Seger. Well, like lots of old stuff too. Um, Iron Maiden. Anyway, there's there's tons of bands where he'd get into that are not speed oriented at all yeah and his whole show live is just like how fast can you go at a consistent rate and so he treats it like a sport so he doesn't treat drumming i mean i'm sure he when he jams at home it's a little bit more of a groove thing but Hmm. you know there's a certain aspect of it where you have to turn that side off and think just movement just technicality and i even have to do that with a lot of aura stuff but my raw emotion just pulls itself through no matter what i want to do and that's what makes me screw up on stage which is totally fine by me because it's masked by just the the amount of energy I'm putting into it and how much I'm trying to physically perform as opposed to like technically perform. So this is actually a pretty nice segue to further down questions, but I'll, I'll address now. Good. I'll address them now while we're on a topic. Do you still get nervous before a show? And if when you're playing a show, how do you address, you know, missing, missing a Tom hit or missing a, you know, you hit a rim you miss a symbol, you drop a stick. How, how do you recover from that? Um, th- they kind of go hand in hand. Um, I think it's interesting. I think it's subtle, though, the difference. Because, first of all, I really only think I get nervous if I'm playing the first few shows of a new artist I haven't played with before. And that's mainly because I haven't let my muscle memory sink into the live aspect of playing it. And I probably was the same way. I think I was a little nervous the first couple times I played with even Auras and even my first bands before that. Um, one of my first shows, though, in high school was um, it was like a pep rally for the school. So there was like 1,500 people there, just everyone in school. And my band played, I was in grade nine, and we played the Monster Mash, like a punk version of that and some other songs. And I was nervous as hell, and there was like 1,500 people there. So after that show, everything kind of seemed a little bit more timid, sort of. So I know um, you played with Kim Mitchell yeah, on that, tour this summer. You weren't nervous at all for that? That would be one of those times where I was a little nor- nervous. That, and not even, like, it's funny, because I was nervous the first time. Um, it was in uh, Oromocto, New Brunswick, near New Brun- New, um, uh, not too far from Fredericton. And my aunt and uncle live near there. So my parents came out to both visit them and then see the show. So there was also the added nerve of not just playing properly mm. for a guy that cares. And he also, I mean, Kim's a guy that... Not only does he pay attention to the drummer, and the, the that's obviously the foundation of his music, so he needs to feel comfortable on top of it, but he's got one of the best like senses of time I've ever... He's a pretty solid uh, musician. But no I, 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 it's, it's, it's bizarre the amount of fluctuation you can make, like a tiny, tiny fraction of fluctuation, and he knows immediately, and he'll address it after. He'll just let you know. It's not like, you know, for me, at least it wasn't a big deal to him. If it was like a, you know, because I'd push it up because I'd be, my adrenaline would be going crazy. And like you said, I'm, I'm sort of in a position where I'm allowed to, I feel like I'm allowed to be nervous because this is something where many people have done before. And, you know, there's a history of performance behind all of these tunes. So I'm not the first one to be able to sort of dictate what it's going to sound like. Whereas with my own band, I'm the one that dictates the way it sounds like. So if, you know the first time i play it couldn't have been as bad or it couldn't have been as nerve-wracking as it was with kim uh yeah in the same way it's it's more about like when when i miss something or anything else goes um goes askew i think it's a lot more about the vision of what's going to happen in the future i think i'm thinking more about moving forward as opposed to what just happened and the interesting thing is that the more I get myself acquainted with the muscle memory behind the way the song feels as opposed to just not even the hits or any of those things, but just letting my body move to the way that the song feels, which sounds like a hilarious cheesy dance move thing. But honestly, it, it, that's, that's right. I I need to make sure that my body is, is kind of just flowing with the, with the tune in general and moving towards the, the pieces that I need to move towards. Like if there's a fill or if there's like a section that's like, five bars long instead of four or something like that. 
So you're always looking that, forward. And I don't want to have to think about that yeah. stuff so that if I do make mistakes or drop a stick or any of that stuff, I'm just letting the rest of it just run its course. And I'm able to think more about picking up that stick and reviving before anyone else really even notices that it even happened. So Which, th- that kind of touches back of what we spoke earlier with uh, versus, you know, the metronome, very serious, focused, technical drummer versus the one that's feeling. Yeah. The one that's feeling is, you know, the moments passed. He's always, you know, he's already looking ahead where the technical guy might still beat himself up over a stupid rim shot or uh, totally uh, missed anything. Yeah. Symbol or hi-hats. there's too many things to happen to be worried about that kind of thing. I think at least, and I try to get a lot of my students to th- think less about the little things that they're doing and more about the general flow of how things worked because. I don't know, the average listener doesn't notice most of the things that are happening with the drums. They only notice if things are not on the hit that they were going to be on, because rhythm implies there's like a futuristic motion to rhythm. Like, you know what's coming up if it's been like that. Whereas if you change the tempo immediately, you the audience kind of, or at least the listener itself um, themselves will maybe feel uncomfortable for even a second or just at least notice that something's different. <clears throat> Whereas if you just keep that flow going, if you miss the snare or you miss the bass drum or you miss whatever, as long as the hits are still moving in the same direction, the average listener is completely oblivious to it. And that's kind of one of the cool parts about playing drums, even though there is a lot of pressure into making sure things are consistent. So as long as you're concentrating on consistency, it feels like the rest of it kind of does the work for you. There you go. Very smart, white, wise, white, <coughs> wise word white from as the hell. man himself. I'm damn white. Hey, uh, if um, actually, let me ask you this: Can you cry underwater? Can I which? Can you cry underwater? Oh, can you cry underwater? Mm-hmm. I don't know. Can your tear ducts create? I don't know. That's a great question. I don't. I don't know. I've never. Tr- I've never. Never been sad while submerged. <laughs> I can't. I've never been sad while submerged. That's never, yeah, I've never had to go through that. Um, do you know the answer? Can I, or are we just like... I do know the answer. <clears throat> can you not? You can. Okay. I, feel, I mean, I feel like it makes sense because it's not like you're, it's not sweating. I feel like sweating, maybe you can't do underwater, but maybe you can. Although your tear ducts and your eyes are technically closed underwater, some people can keep them open. But yeah, it's not like you can't. Uh, Interesting. It can be done. Actually, I just realized too that what I said about the sweating underwater doesn't make any sense because if you're in a hot tub, you can definitely sweat. You're definitely hot Hell. as hell. So, well, hell. Well, I'm not saying there's like <laughs> chemicals to dilute that. Bromine and chlorine, yes, thanks. Well, hopefully, no more bl- bromine. That's for. It's the worst shit. Who was your first teacher? Who who uh, taught you the the way of the tambour? Uh, well, just kind of going back to the first bit, um, my dad's first drummer, or my dad's drummer, his name is, um, uh, Andy McPherson. He's actually, uh, Hi, Andy. he's actually a high school teacher, um, cool. in the Waterloo region. He, I think he's at St. Mary's still. I think he's been there for years, unless he's gone somewhere since. Um, and he also plays vibraphone in a jazz band. Like his, dr- he has cool. a drummer separately. Like he's a very, very musically apt person. Um, and he, I had a few lessons from him when I was six, so way before I had my first kit. Paradiddle is really the only thing I actually remember he taught me. I'm sure he taught me maybe a couple other things like flam and some little things, but my first main teacher when I had the drum kit, um, so I got a drum kit four months into being 12 years old. It was April, some 12th, 14th, something like that. Holy moly. I don't know why I remember that. Weird. It was just something that I kind of had to keep in my mind. (laughs) <laughs> um, and then about, I think a year, maybe less than that after my parents, um, they're really good friends that live in Hespler, Cambridge, um, used to have a neighbor who had moved to Collingwood and he was a drum teacher and they were just like, Oh, it seems like a great idea. turns out he was the best idea. <laughs> he, uh, he was a total like technical hand, um, not technical generally, but like he was, he knew that what I needed to know was how to get my my technique you know in a way that it could serve me as a player because I think he always saw that you know I I, the coordination side of things he busted through a lot as well but he always knew that I had the 
the longing to keep playing. Like I was never, it was never a matter of, Hey, did you play this week? Cause I did every single day pretty yeah. much. And he knew that I might not have practiced what we did, but I generally played a lot. And I think that sort of, that sort of let him teach me a little easier. Cause he kind of understood that it wasn't going to take a lot to convince me that this was going to be useful. Like he could just say it. And then I would be totally all about that. So he, uh, yeah, Don, his name is Don Reed. I guess I didn't bring that up. Don Reed. Uh, and he actually, a couple years ago, he and I had lunch here in Kitchener and, um, uh, he kind of just helped me out with some structure instruction for, cause I've been teaching for seven or eight years now or nine years now. And he gave me a bunch of sheets of stuff that we used to do back in the day and gave me cool. some pointers on, you know, like just kind of organization and things like that. So he's been a really big help for me from really the get go. And the way that I started teaching seven, eight, nine years ago was really the way he started teaching me. So it became part of my, my career really in a lot of ways, just the way that he approached things. Um, we do half an hour of hands just working on little things like flams and rudiments and, and actually for a while we worked on a solo that back then they had only 26 rudiments. I remember, I know you, when you learned they only 26 rudiments for sure. 26 drum rudiments. Oh, yeah. yeah, they have 40 now. Like they've had 40 for the past like 10 years or something, maybe less, but 40 rudiments is the official amount now. Hmm. But I've all, always only seen three, like double paradiddle and flam, and then combinations of that makes up almost everything else yeah. in, in lots of ways. I mean, there's buzzes, there's things like that. Single stroke even gets another... I guess a, a, a honorable mention there, but generally he was just always, it was for him, it was always important to worry about rudiments. So we ended up going over a solo that had all 26 rudiments, uh, in the solo Holy and moly. that ended up actually getting me, um, a spot in Les Mis musical production, Les Miserables and lots of other, just, it was just way easier, um, to get through a lot of my experimental stuff by having some of that stuff in my, in my repertoire, really just flam patterns like Radam cues and just little things like that, that Flamme you don't really, yeah, you don't yeah. really see that stuff on the drum kit. And then when you're playing drums one day on a kit, you sort of just notice that you did it and it's not really something you think about. It's just something that out of habit kind of comes out. So it's a lot of things that he did for me that just became fundamentally important to the way I just approach the drum kit in every way. All right, how about uh, who's your favorite musician or drummer or song of all time or both? <sighs> song is really tough, but I mean, drummer's easy. I'll start with that. Um, my favorite drummer is definitely Benny Greb. He's from Germany. Hmm. And he doesn't actually play with anyone. Like he's Well, he, he has his own band called Moving Parts. Um, but he... That's, I mean, I just knew about him from being a drummer, like a clinician. I think he was a session guy a lot in Germany. Um, it's more about his approach. Um, I don't know. He, he's got lots of fluidity, lots of finesse, lots of tons of dynamics. And he's one of those guys that he's not too concerned about. Um, he's not too concerned about the antics or any of the... I've never seen him flip a stick or any of that stuff. Like he's just always been about what feels really good in very um, open ways. Like he doesn't really play a lot of stuff a lot of the times. It's just more about what he's playing, where he's playing it, and all those things. And he's just he's a he's a pleasure to watch as far as like being like in performance mode as well as just being in clinician mode. Like when he's talking about when he's in a drum clinic and he's talking about his methods or his, his thoughts. It's always hilarious. He's just funny as hell. How about this? Why don't you ever see baby pigeons? <laughs> That's a great question. No. I have no idea. I've never seen a baby pigeon myself. Maybe I Nor was wondering I. if you did. I mean, maybe birds grow fast and they're just in the nest for like, you know, a couple, couple weeks and then they're already almost the size of regular pigeons. And we just don't really notice it. Like, we don't really see a lot of baby birds, generally. Or even right? a baby seagull. Like, Yeah. I mean, I feel like that's... Because we do see baby geese. We do. And baby ducks and stuff. But I feel like the ducks and the geese, they're they're not really in a nest situation. They're more of an, in like yeah. a 
a water situation, so he's in the in the water. But I don't know. I mean, if, if I ever come across a pigeon nest, I'll take a picture for take you. Take a picture, please. Yeah, I'd love to. Actually, that's a funny thing. All right, second and last question for you, sir. Tell us about your last revelation. Could be small, could be big, could be in the last 24 hours, could be in the last week. I feel like I have revelations every day. There you go. So do um, I. I mean, they're always little, very technical things for me. I feel like a lot of times it's, I'll be, you know, recording something and then realize that if I just back off 2 dB on something, it makes a huge difference. Like, for example, I was mixing a song lately and I realized that if the guitars were just a tiny bit quieter, everything would just pop right out and the guitars were just too loud. I didn't even realize it. I just thought the mix was kind of MIDI. So <laughs> there's a lot of really weird technical things that happened to me where I just noticed that, you know, this whole time I've been doing something one way and it turns out that if I was a little more delicate about it, it would be, it would work the way that I want it to work. Hmm. Even though it doesn't seem that practical to begin with. So automate your mix. Minus two yeah, the Yeah, it's the other thing is that automating is another thing that I've I've actually tried to to remind myself is a lot more important than I actually give it credit for. But then there's the whole question of what order should you automate things in and will the trail of automating ever end? <laughs> nope. Nope. We both, we both know the answer to that and I know... Irvin is probably listening to this dude and he's probably shaking his head like going, oh God. I just, I just want to make sure that the mix will eventually get finished and I feel like I'll turn into a skeleton before that happens. There's a great picture floating around on social media stuff of a, of a guy that says, uh, finally, the, is it the, the skeleton? Mix is perfect. Yeah, the skeleton a, on the... Skeleton on the SSL board. Yeah. That's oh, yeah. Funny. That's right. Yeah. No, I've <laughs> seen that. And you know the band Necrophagist? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's one, there's the same meme of that, like, the Necrophagist album is almost complete, and it's the same, it's the same thing. These it's guys are insanely it. technical. Oh, like, yeah, that's... Holy... The one guy from that band is from someone else, like a Cannibal Corpse or something like that. And if you there. guys have a chance, while we, while Night Dog here dropped the word, um, do I have a song called uh, Diminished to Be, and that song is just... Whether you're a drummer, whether you're a guitar right. player, or whether you're a bass player, it's it will blow your mind. So check it out for sure. Yeah, that's a crazy band. Last question for you, sir. What came first, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> well, honestly, the chicken, because it wasn't the chicken. Well, I mean, well, that doesn't even make sense. <laughs> It's going to be the egg that had the mutation in it to create the chicken. That's what came first. It was definitely the egg because there's no way that that birth could have happened or the mutation could have happened after birth. Mutation happens through cell reproduction. And so if the cell reproduction happens pre-egg or during egg fertility, then that's what happened first. It was the egg because before the chicken, it was something else. We don't know what it was. I don't even know. I don't, I'm sure it was something nameable. but And then it had an egg, and then that egg was actually a chicken. There we go. Just an evolution, just an evolutionary, like, I'm just following the path of what I assume is, you know, <laughs> correct. Sure, sure. From all these years of research, but I haven't done enough. Well, ladies and gents, there you go. There you have it. Nate Dog and the Closet uh, Q&A session it's in Waterloo, Ontario. Me tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, what's going on with your band this summer? Do you want to? Can we drop the other band thing too? Do you want to talk yeah, about yeah. that project before we uh, shut uh, down this thing? Well, I mean, I'm. I'll be going out on the road in the next. I think in four weeks from now, um, with a band called Intervals from Toronto. Intervals. I N T E R V A L S. And it's an instrumental progressive rock band. Um, I filled in with them before. The real drummer is a really good friend of mine. Um, but now it's it, it, the newest record was recorded by um, a guy named Travis Orban, who's a relatively well-known um, session drummer and plays in a band called Darkest Hour. And so I'm 
currently going through those parts and just kind of getting myself prepped to go on the road with them for five weeks and then coming home and then going back on the road with my own band, Auras, um, across Canada and some of the states for a bit too. So, and beyond that, we'll see. I mean, I think I might be going out with with intervals again, but I haven't. We haven't fully done that whole confirmation thing, so I don't know. We'll see. Well, there you go, folks. Go see Nathan play live. Uh, how do you suggest uh, witnessing the uh, young feller here behind the skins? <laughs> Just going bananas the whole time. Bananas. Well, let's see if I learn this stuff first, and then. Then I'll tell you to come out. See, my revelation <laughs> today is that you say the word banana a lot. Yeah, it's my thing. He, he was talking about his banana hammock earlier, too. I was, yeah, banana hammocks <laughs> is like another one that I, I definitely... There's a few. Well, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Nathan, thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>